All right, welcome, welcome everybody to another edition of the Cultural Podcast. This time we are going to talk on two different topics. One real quick, uh, as you may or may not know, I enjoy the fight game. I enjoy MMA, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, things like that. So let's look at recently there was a, a little scuffle that went on during a political campaign event. Let's, little, let's analyze this real quick. So here we go. <laughs> and there's another angle to this video where these two individuals had some words for each other. And then one of them, you know, started, started brawling. So let's look. This starts mid, mid scuffle, mid fight. So there's some previous action that we missed out on so we don't get full context which will be interesting to see but let's just study what happens here so initially all right let's play this so here's the beginning we can see uh the black dude has the guy with two arms from from the back going into his armpits not really uh you know, underhooks, but in jiu-jitsu, if he had an arm in, that would be the right way, whether it's his left or right. If he's doing an arm in guillotine to choke the guy out, that would be the way to do it. But he's got two arms, two arms in, and you can't choke that way. So obviously this black dude doesn't know what he's doing. The other guy seems to be, you know, putting his head all up in his armpit, which is not very smart. But he does seem to... Go for a double leg. So let's look. Okay. So he seems to get a double leg. His two, his two, his two legs are in the air. I don't know if he's jumping to sort of go for the guillotine. You can see the black dude's right arm is now released. His left arm is still in. So he wants to do. I don't know if he's thinking he's going to try to do an arm in guillotine, but this guy does goes for a double leg, man. So he knows a little bit what he's doing. Uh, in another video, you can see he sort of looks like a you know a little a little white dude that's you know trying to video and has some words for him. But it looks like a pretty legit double leg here, and he and he lets go of the left side with his left arm, but they he slams him pretty much, you know, falling down on a chair and then on the ground. And that's got to, that's got to, you know, be a little bit of something on his back. So pretty much the dude took him down. That arm in guillotine wasn't going nowhere. He didn't have the right arm all the way into the, underneath the neck, underneath the throat. So dude pretty much had the advantage and slammed him. It probably caused some pain to his back. And uh, the black dude was the one that actually initiated the, uh, the physical contact, I believe. And then you can see after this, everyone comes and breaks it up. So just a little interesting aspect here uh, of, uh, you know, the brawl. Let's look at it all in. Boom. Boom. Right on his back, and everyone breaks in, of course. Let's uh, check it out. Check it out. Everyone breaks in and, and breaks it up and everything. And the guy's very light, so he just like, gets slung to the side a little bit. That dude wants nothing else, man. He just goes about his business. He's like, okay, let me play off this little pain I have in my back. But bam, he just slams him on the chair. And that chair sort of saved him. Because if he would have went straight to the ground, that might have hurt his lower back a little. And dude, uh, you know, dude pulls him off fairly easily since he's, you know, a little bit on the light side. But just a little of an analysis here. I don't know. I want to say this white dude's got a little bit of wrestling background to be able to do that. Or, or you know, watching some WWE or something. Uh, black dude, I think he's just holding on. I don't think he was going or even knows what an arm and guillotine is. But that was a little interesting scuffle that happened. Uh, you know, at, this, at these uh, political events. And that, yeah, that dude, he's just uh, turning around. He's like, okay. I don't want any more of that. My back is a little bit of uh, is a little bit in pain. Uh, and there you have it. So moving on, 
I'll tend to do these every now and then and I'll analyze a little bit of the fight game. Moving on now, now so let's go talk a little bit about poetry life. Okay. Uh, okay, what's going on? can't scroll. Here we go. So this article came out on why did I why did it take a white chef to pique my interest in my own Mexican culture? And this is uh, the reason we're going over this. I want to talk about this a little bit is because of the pocho culture. Here you see Tox's path to becoming a Chicano taco expert. Now Chicano taco expert there, you know, it's iffy. We, we gotta we gotta we gotta question the quality of what taco is then we have a hard shell taco it looks like from taco bell so immediately there you're like okay what's going on here this isn't legit mexican food um and let's let's go into like a chicano food maybe but that's a hard shell taco right there man that picture does not look legit so he starts off saying yeah he's t uh, tacos are his life dude uh, many Americans say this as well, like white dudes, not just Mexican Americans. But uh, he starts off saying, like, half of, you know, as most pochos who get Americanized, he preferred any other cuisine other than Mexican food. I never wanted to eat my mother's cooking, her spongy chicharron and salsa verde, her soggy chilaquiles, made the traditional way the, the leftover tortillas, her extra garlic -y salsas, hid in an old margarine container, her stinky and pasteurized cheese. Gifted by one loved ones who's returned from trips back home. Okay, so he talks about, you know, this oddball food for an American, which is just Mexican items. He continues saying that, you know, his, his life is personal pan pizzas from Pizza Hut on Monday. Greasy brown bags of curly fries from Jack in the Box. Tuesdays hamburgers on, on Mc, from McDonald's. Oh, that just sounds, you know, horrific. Uh, that's that's the American life. That's the push of lifestyle, dudes. We gotta understand that you know parents can be, and his parents, as it states right here, both parents were born in Zacatecas, Mexico, moved to East LA, even in LA, and he was influenced immediately. Americanized pizzas, uh, curly fries, hamburgers. Immediately Americanized. Did not want anything to do with chilaquiles. Did not want anything to do with Mexican dishes. What the heck? Okay, so, you know, it continues on. And this is the typical awesome picture right here. So he's, he, he you know, he goes back and he disses. Now. He, realize, he realizes now that Mexican food is great. And he disses the American food that he used to love. Bland American staples. He used to choose over the cuisine of his heritage in here. You know, this is classic Chicago Bulls fan, American hat. Okay. So it began, began to change as a teenager. He began to be into, like, these new American, you know, fads. Uh, he began to sort of like different international types of food, falafels. Couldn't afford them, but he liked the menus. Different types of kitchen, uh, you know, uh, kitchen shows, cooking shows. He saw an episode of Rick Bayless's Mexico one plate of a, at a time. So these are American shows right here. A white chef from Oklahoma making things like Siki Pak, Siki Pak, whatever that is, a Mayan pumpkin seed salsa. Okay, he understood a little bit about what Mexican food was. He began to be passionate about it. Now, this is just, you know, sort of uh, by chance, right? He, he began to like exotic and new different types of international foods, Mexican being one of them, which is foreign to him, since he was so much into, into you know, American food and pizza. But this is where it gets, you know, a little bit... A little bit spicy. Talks about internet. Why did it take long for him to love his own culture? Internalized racism. He thought that his food, that his culture uh, from Mexico, from his parents, was unhealthy, was lesser, was cheap, dirty, 
that could cause multi-system much revenge. Now, I grew up in the United States as, Ameri as Americanized or even more so as this dude, but I never thought that my mom's tamales or salsa or whatever was unhealthy or cheap or dirty. You know, I, I would eat it, and that was it. It was just another plate. You know, I, I loved American food as well, but, you know, if, there, if a Mexican if tacos came on the menu for my mom, then... That's what we ate. Uh, he says he could, go, he could go back in time. He would tell my spoiled brat kid self to go ahead and make a meal out of tacos de frijol because that's what made your parents strong. So he's just like, you know, he's all into Mexican, Mexican culture, not all into Mexican food. He says it shouldn't have taken him this long, but now the rest of the country is catching up. And this is where we go to this picture of this hard shell taco here. The rest of the country is really catching up. What country? Mexico? No. The United States, in the United States, and I've said this plenty of times before, very hard in any place in the United States to, to, to get a legit, authentic taco. The best tacos in the world are in Mexico, not in the United States, especially from a, an article that has this hard shell Taco Bell looking thing right here. We're in the midst of a taco awakening. True that, true that man. I see white dudes all the time saying, Taco Tuesday, I love me some tacos. And in Austin here, they go to uh, Tex-Mex taco places, not really legit, such as uh, Chewy's or uh, uh, Torchy's tacos. Now look at this. This is even proof. $20 carnitas, vegan al pastor. What the heck? Hamachi filled chili. This is some... This is some uh, new world taco full unfolding so this is some like new inventions some Tex-Mex type stuff some Cali Mex whatever this is some Mexicans are perfect type of Shea Serrano type of abomination of Americanized tacos and then he continues to remind you why you shouldn't complain about the bill at a nice Mexican restaurant. I will surely complain about the bill at a nice Mexican restaurant because when I go to Mexico I'm paying a few pesos for plenty of tacos. And in the United States, $2 for one taco. Maybe three or four. That is crazy. You could get 15 for that price in Mexico. So yes, I'm going to play. I want to complain about the prices here. If I want a great taco, I'm not going to any place in the United States. I'm going to Mexico. Now we got to settle. We got to have, you know, the... You know, if we want, you know, something similar, sure, we can have, find a place here in the United States that's made by Mexicans. Uh, you know, they're all speaking Spanish. The legit type of place you can buy, you can find, and then go and get some tacos. Uh, but I don't think, okay, well, I wouldn't think twice about playing Italian or French. Uh, that seat does have, sort of have a point. When you go to an Italian restaurant, you sort of expect a high price. Mexican restaurants... I'm going to a hole in the wall, and the prices aren't going to be as bad as some fancy, nice Mexican restaurant. I don't even go to a fancy, nice Mexican restaurant in the U.S. Be because, you know, that it's exactly what this article is about, Tex-Mex. And this guy knows what's up because he helped, uh, you know, like he says, he's an associate producer for the Taco Chronicles. Uh, Taco Chronicles, that's on Netflix. That was a legit, you know, there's places all in Mexico. You know, some L.A. locations... And I think Texas, but, you know, the legit spots and the legit places for this uh, documentary were in Mexico. So, he, you know, I just wanted to mention this. This is a typical scenario. And I saw his uh, Twitter replies. This is typical scenarios for many Mexican-Americans. But you can see how many can slip through the cracks, how many can Americanize. And he was lucky. And all the other ones that are lucky to find their Mexican culture and love it, in the end, I think are few and far between. There's tons out there, sure, but there's tons more out there that continue on and, you know, leave their Mexican culture to the side. They're American. They've assimilated, and that's just the way it is. And they, you know, they go on being uh, Joe, Joe Sanchez, or, you know, and continue on being uh, a typical American, speaking English, forgetting the Spanish, forgetting the Mexican cuisine, like this guy. Now this guy is a, a you know a unique case, not not truly rare, but not very you know uh, 
huge in numbers that, that fall into this category. And we see this with the Mexican soccer community in English. Uh, there's no huge numbers with Mexican soccer fans in English. The LAFC is another good example. All the fans in LA that are Mexican-American, some speak Spanish, some don't, go for LAC, LAFC, root for LAFC, because they haven't had that inculcation of being a Cruz Azul fan from their parents or being a America or Chivas fan. Uh, you know, that... that uh, that heritage or that culture that's been passed down, like this guy's talking about, didn't take effect. So they would rather, you know, root for LAFC and their hometown American soccer club in the United States. Sure, speak some Spanish, have some Spanish chants and still, you know, have that culture a little bit, but you lose also some of it when you root for an MLS team. Uh, so I think this all goes to the premise of Americanized, Chicanos or Pochos that sort of lose their culture, lose their interest in things that are that are Mexican, such as the sport of soccer, such as Liga and MX teams, and end up being fans of NBA. Like this guy said, he he's a fan of pizza and hamburgers. Many many kids are gonna be fans of NBA, of NFL, they're gonna play NBA and NFL and or MMA or whatever. Not so much soccer. So, uh, U.S. is not a soccer sport, so many of these kids are not going to be into soccer. They're going to be like, change that channel, man. I know Grandpa will be watching some America, but I don't want to watch that. I don't watch me some Denver Broncos. Dude, give me a, give me a, uh, you know, a hamburger and some steak, and let me watch some, some New England Patriots. <laughs> so that's the, uh, you know, my. Uh, the, the podcast for today, a little pocho talk here, a little Chicano talk, uh, but props to this dude, man, follow him, what's his name, Javier Cabral, follow this dude, man, he has his Twitter down here, I am, I follow him, the Glutster, he's a cool dude, man, follow him, check him out, check out his, uh, you know, his, his, uh, transformation, his return to the culture, and many other people have expressed that he, that this story uh, is similar to many of their stories. It's similar to my story a little bit. Uh, I, I'm just I'm just saying it's a little bit unique. It's a little bit pochified. It's a little bit chicanified. Not truly legit Mexican. But that's the way it is in the U.S., man. That's this country. You try to, you know, once you cross that Mexican border to the United States, you're leaving behind a little bit of, a little bit of yourself, a little bit of your Spanish, a little bit of your culture. You forget a little bit of that. And very few people get up and be like, you know, I'm going back. I'm staying back. Going back to Mexico. Abandoning the United States. You know, so thanks for listening. Stay tuned for more. We're going to pump these things out. Talk to you guys later.